ten thirty five. Oh, do, do we need to check with the rain meter? Okay, let's go. Welcome. I'm so glad you're worshiping with us today. Uh, we pray that this will be a blessing to you and that your worship will bless the Lord too. We want to especially welcome any who are visiting with us today. Thank you for coming and joining us today. If you uh, need to know more about uh, GPC or about our denomination or anything, feel free to talk to me, Pastor Paul over here. Pastor Archie and his family are away this week. Archie's at the beach with his family and uh, hopes to be back with us next week. But again, welcome. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. Just a few general announcements for the young folks, the youth, uh, grades 6 through 12. Tonight is the last of the summer youth programs. All are invited, even if you haven't come before, uh, if you're in that age group, uh, we would invite you to come and join tonight. I understand that the girls are going to have a cooking contest. Don't know what the result will be, but anyway, uh, that will be part of it, uh, basketball for the guys. Now, that's not the last youth activity of the summer. Saturday the 24th, there will be a lake day. Uh, you'll, everyone will gather here at GPC at 10 a.m. and then head down to Calhoun Falls State Park. Plack, pack your own lunch. Uh, there will be drinks and snacks made available. And then everyone will be back to GPC here by about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. If you're not going to drive yourself, uh, please pick up and sign a waiver. I have one here. There's some on the back table. Uh, Emma can get you one if you don't have one, uh, but if you're going to be riding with the GPC group, not with your own family, please uh, sign one of these waivers. And finally, ladies, the women of the church will have their uh, Keystone Neighborhood Pool Brunch. This will be on the uh, 31st from 9 to 12. This will be brunch, fellowship, and fun, so uh, if you need directions or something, ask any of those who are active in WIC. I can tell you how to get there. Uh, the, the Burnett's back there. From that neighborhood, they can tell you how to, to reach it if you don't know. I think we've covered everything. Any other announcements? If not, then, let's give attention to God's Word as we reflect on these words from the book of Acts, chapter 10. This is a portion of our scripture text for today. So let's give attention to God's Word.
please stand as we're called to worship from Galatians chapter 3. So in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Let's join our hearts together for we sing all creatures of our God and King. Father, we've gathered here today to join together in glorifying you, the Almighty, the Creator, the Holy God, the just and loving God. You've called us to yourself and declared that you will be our God and we will be your people. You have made us one in Christ. As we worship today, we ask that you'll lead us to a deeper trust in you, that we might abide in the shadow of the Almighty and declare that you are our refuge and fortress in whom we trust. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. Our call to confession of sin is actually a prayer that comes from the worship source book. And so as we're called to confess, 
I'll lead us in this prayer, and then let's join together in time of silent prayer, confessing individually to God specific sins and seeking that by His grace we might turn in repentance and be forgiven. So let's join our hearts. Let me lead us as we pray. Our Father, forgive us for thinking small thoughts of you and for ignoring your immensity and greatness. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we forget that you rule the nations and our small lives. Holy Spirit, we offend you in minimizing your power and squandering your gifts. We confess that our blindness to your glory, O triune God, has resulted in shallow confession, lukewarm conviction, and only mild repentance. Have mercy upon us, in Jesus' name. Let's pray silently. Father, we thank you that by the blood of Jesus Christ, our sins have been forgiven. We thank you, Lord, that he took your wrath upon himself, your wrath that was due to each of us sinners. And we thank you that by your grace, his righteousness is, is imputed to us, that we might be made together one in Christ. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words of assurance come in the form of responsive reading from Psalm 103. If you will, please respond. The Lord is merciful and gracious. He will not always chide. He does not deal with us according to our sins. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love toward those who fear him. Our hymn of assurance is Grace Unmeasured. Again, let's stand together and sing.
Would you please be seated? This morning, we're called to prayer and informed what to pray for from our passage in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 to 25. So these words will lead me as I lead all of us in prayer, that we might more and more, every one of us, young and old, be the people that God is calling us to be. Let's pray together. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. And since we live by the Spirit, let us keep in step with the Spirit. Our Father and our God, that would be our simple prayer this morning for Greenwood Presbyterian Church and for your church universal, for all who profess faith in the Lord Jesus. We would pray that we young and old, would all be characterized by this fruit, by this character of godliness. Lord, would you work in us that every time we gather as a church and every time your word is read and preached, every time fellowship with the saints is experienced, that those times would be shaping us with this fruit of the Spirit that we might learn from one another, seeing in others what kindness looks like, what gentleness looks like, learning from others what repentance looks like in the Christian life. Lord, would you shape us by one another and through the power of your Holy Spirit? Lord, whether it's Vacation Bible School or our youth group, or our men's prayer group, or our women's Bible studies, our small groups, and of course our time of worship together corporately, would you use all of these times throughout every week to be shaping your people into your likeness and into your image? Lord, we would also pray for the saints, not just here but worldwide, those who are fighting for health, those who are fighting for life, would you be near to them and remind them that you are an ever-present help in times of trouble, in times of fear, in times of doubt. Lord, for believers who are suffering from loneliness, from discouragement, and from despair, would you be near to them? Would you bless them that they might feel your nearness, that the gospel would warm their hearts in such a way as only you can minister to your people. And Lord, for those gathered here and throughout the world who profess your name, who are living through financial crisis, uncertainty of employment, change of direction, and not knowing where they might wind up, Lord, would you be near to them Would you remind them how faithful you have been to your people and how much you can be trusted with our lives? Lord, in all these things, we want to be found to be faithful. We want it to be said of us, well done, good and faithful servants. But Lord, only you can provide the faith, the repentance, the obedience that is necessary. And we ask for you to do it. We pray for you to do it. In Jesus' name, amen. For many weeks now, we have been looking to the scriptures for an understanding of what does it mean to be the church. And I've told you we only have a few more weeks on this subject. Uh, Our hope is in the month of September to turn the page 
and begin something new together. Which means I only have a few more weeks to cover some of the content of the book of Acts and many other individual subjects that you probably have in your mind about the church. And if you don't have them in your mind, that I would hope that you'll have them in your mind. And the last few weeks have been significant if you've been able to track and pay attention. They've been significant because we've been looking at the early church and the key conversions, the coming to faith in Jesus that Luke the doctor has recorded for us. And all of them have been mind-blowing. A few weeks ago in Acts chapter 8, we heard of a dark-skinned Ethiopian eunuch who all of his life would have been an outsider, shut out from the people of God, only able to get to the outer courts of God for worship. We saw him come to faith in Jesus through the hearing of Scripture, repent and be baptized and be welcomed into the church. And if you're a first century Jew hearing that, your mind would be blown because that's not how we thought or understood the kingdom of God would work. And then last week, if you were with us, in Acts chapter 9, we heard how a zealous, religious, Jewish man who was prepared to be a Pharisee burned with hatred against the Christian church and against Jesus himself. And this man was brought to faith in Christ by Jesus himself, repented of his sin, was baptized, was called a brother. He was welcomed into the family of God. And that was mind-blowing for that first century audience that heard it. And now this morning, your minds should be blown again. I hope that you're not too familiar with these stories, that they're just too comfortable for you. But this morning we have a passage that is so significant because it is going to change the paradigm for how we understand the faith, the Christian faith, to be pervasive in the world as we know it. This morning we're going to hear the story of a Roman centurion, an Italian man, an officer of Rome, is brought to faith along with his whole household, all of which are baptized. They repent of their sin and they're welcomed into the family. It is a beautiful story, number one. And number two, it is a long story. This may go down as the new record for the longest single passage read, not by me this morning, but by Jimmy Walters. Jimmy is going to come and read this lengthy passage But give your attention to it. Hear the wonder and the shock and the paradigm shift that God presents before his people. Our text today is the 10th chapter of Acts. If you'd like to read along in your Bible, I'll be reading from the New International Version. Hear the word of God. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion in what was known as the Italian Regiment. He and all his family were devout and God-fearing. He gave generously to those in need and prayed to God regularly. One day at about three in the afternoon, he had a vision. He distinctly saw an angel of God who came to him and said, Cornelius. Cornelius stared at him in fear. What is it, Lord? he asked. The angel answered, Your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. He is staying with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, Cornelius called two of his servants and a devout soldier who was one of his attendants. He told them everything that had happened, and sent them to Joppa. About noon the following day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat, and while the meal was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw heaven opened, and something like a large sheet 
being let down to the earth by its four corners. It contained all kinds of four-footed animals as well as reptiles of the earth and birds of the air. Then a voice told him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied. I've never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and immediately the sheep was taken back to heaven. While Peter was wondering about the meaning of the vision, the men sent by Cornelius found out where Simon's house was and stopped at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who was known as Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still looking about the vision, the Spirit said to him, Simon, three men are looking for you, so get up and go downstairs. Do not hesitate to go with them, for I have sent them. Peter went down and said to the men, I'm the one you're looking for. Why have you come? The men replied, We have come from Cornelius the centurion. He is a righteous and God-fearing man who is respected by all the Jewish people. A holy angel told him to have you come to his house so that he could hear what you have to say. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message of God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee, after the baptism that John preached, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with them. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God anointed, appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. 
Father, you have spoken through your word. May we take these words, hide them in our hearts, and apply them to our lives, that you might be glorified in us. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. So I told you it was a long passage. And not only is it a long passage, but you noticed, hopefully, the details are told twice. Twice within the same passage, Luke, the author, the medical doctor, the man of precision and caution and detail, twice in the same passage he's outlining the content of what has happened. Now, if you have your Bible open and you look at uh, Acts chapter 11, the very next chapter, the same story is told yet again in great detail. So, as Sinclair Ferguson says on this passage, what is going on here? Is Luke just a really bad and boring storyteller that he doesn't realize it's not a good idea to say the same thing over and over again? Or is what happens in this passage so important and so significant to understanding Jesus in the gospel that Luke is using, this is what Sinclair Ferguson says, his first century highlighter to underscore the importance of this event in redemptive history. And of course, that's what it is. Luke has something he knows is so profound, he wants it to be thoroughly understood and thoroughly believed. And so for the next few minutes, this is my humble and simple effort to try to offer you the details out of that long passage that are given to us numerous times. Even elsewhere in Scripture, this is recounted for us. But I'll start in a silly way. So I'm a sucker for a good infomercial. You know what an infomercial is. Kids, you know what an infomercial is. It's when you're watching TV and somebody is trying to sell a product to you and they just make it too good to be true, right? Uh, through the years, I have been a sucker for a number of things. And the line that always gets me is, but wait, there's more. It just gets better. And as you're watching this, you're like, it would be wrong not to purchase this, right? You get two of them now and with free shipping. And so in my household, I have I've owned the Magic Bullet, two of them actually, the Sham Wow, the Space Bags, and I think I bought three Miracle Blade kits, Miracle Blade sets. Those are all things some of you remember seeing advertised through the years. There's something about the, but wait, there's more. It just gets better that, that perks my attention and my interest. And I've got to say, those words are really appropriate here. If you're paying attention to what's happened in the gospel what's happened with Luke's recording of the works of the apostles and the Holy Spirit on earth. This morning is that, but wait, there's more. It gets even better. The good news gets even better this morning. And so for the next few minutes, I want to try to show that to you, reveal it to you if you've not seen it. And that good news, it begins with an increased menu. Our menus change with what happens in this text. Do you realize that? You and I are no longer bound to an Old Testament dietary code. That if we were worshipers of Yahweh prior to this event, we would have a sense of obligation. Your 4th of July barbecue would have been a whole lot different and so would have mine. So for, so for those of you who love barbecue and fried shrimp at the beach, there's good news that's revealed in this passage of Scripture. It just is. But let me also say this. That's not what the passage is really about. The passage is really about Gentiles, non-Jews, and how the gospel and the kingdom of God includes Gentiles. 
A Gentile is simply a non-Jew. And so the truth is, this morning, this passage is at the very heart, unless you were born in Israel and you're a natural born and practicing Jew, then this, this gives you every reason why you and I can gather this morning in Jesus' name, be received by Him, and hear that assurance of pardon that was applied to us biblically. That's why this story is so big. This is where the doors blow off, so to speak, the city of Jerusalem. And the gospel is seen as going forth with power to Judea and Samaria and the uttermost ends of the earth, which is what Jesus had promised in his earthly ministry. And it's precisely what he said the Holy Spirit would do in Acts chapter 1 and with the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost. So there's a lot of explanation. You're hearing the sum of it right now. But I do have three simple points this morning. But I have to begin with some background context about these characters. And the first is this person, Cornelius. Now that's a unique name, an unusual name. This week I realized I've never known a person named Cornelius. I've known of people. I guess there was Cornelius Van Til, for those who know of that theologian. Of course, there was Yukon Cornelius, for those who remember that Christmas cartoon from way back. Cornelius is just not much of a popular name. And yet he is right at the center of redemptive history. He was a Roman military officer. The text says he was a centurion. That means he was trusted and respected and was given the charge of at least a hundred men. He likely had more responsibilities than that. The text also says of Cornelius that he was a faithful God-fearer. He was a man of prayer, and he was a faithful alms-giver. You might remember we heard about alms several weeks ago. Uh, The beggar outside of the gate, beautiful, was hoping for alms. Alms were offerings. They were gifts to help the poor. And so Cornelius, a proven man, uh, an accomplished man, was a man of prayer. He was an alms giver, and he is what is called a God-fearer. He knew that there was a supreme being, and he worshipped him as best he knew how. But the last thing I'll say about Cornelius is but he was a Gentile. He was an outsider. He would have been welcomed into the outside courts for worship, but not in the inner courts. Like the eunuch, he would have been pushed out, not fully accepted in. And then our second character in the story is, of course, Peter. We've heard much of Peter throughout this series, back in the Gospels and now in the book of Acts. Peter was a disciple, and now is an apostle. And Peter has had his highs, and he has had his lows. But in Acts chapter 9, the second part of Acts 9, which we did not hear from last week when we focused on Saul, he heals a paralyzed man, and he raises Dorcas, Tabitha, from the dead. He is demonstrating the power of Jesus at work through him, proving himself to be an apostle. And so if you wondered why Cornelius and his household fell down before Peter when he walked in the room, it's likely because the reputation of Peter is is known. He just raised somebody from the dead. He healed a paralyzed man. There's something special about this man. But of course you remember Peter's response to, to them bowing to him. He said, get up, I'm just a man. Right? We like it when people recognize who we are as if we're significant. Peter reminds us, you're just a man. You're just a person. Stand on your feet. Don't bow to me, Peter says. And then the third background context that is essential to understand what is at work here is quite simply this. It's the Jew-Gentile relationship. How those two people groups interacted with each other and why they did what they did. And that is that the relationship between Jews and Gentiles was a relationship that was fenced. 
It was fenced. Okay, what do I mean by that? What do you do with a fence? You put fences around things you love. You put fences around things you need to protect. You put fences around things that are important, right? So this week, a friend of mine bought a really nice grill. It's actually a big green egg. He and I went, I helped him purchase it. I helped him move it because that's a very big, heavy object. We put it down in his backyard and his first thought was, somebody's going to try to steal this. He didn't have a fence. So I won't tell you where he lives so that you don't go try to steal it. He didn't have a fence, so what did he do? Literally, he took his children's large yard toys, like these plastic big Jeeps you can drive in, and he blockaded people's view of his grill with the hope that nobody would come and steal it. Why? Because he just paid a lot of money for that thing. He loves that thing, so therefore he fenced that thing. It was important. Now, some of you who have parents, you've fenced your children. I know with my children, I know with students for years, uh, we have this saying that is a true saying, and it is, for those who are dating, nothing good happens after midnight, right? It's called a curfew. And if you really love your people, you tell them things like, nothing really good happens after 11 p.m., <laughs> right? So I've got people who are hearing this right now, <laughs> right? If you love something, you fence it. You put a fence around it. So the Jew-Gentile relationship had fences in it. And one of them was this. This is very important to understand the passage. The biblical revealed will gave Israel some very specific things to follow, even down to their diet code that we'll hear in just a minute. But the Israelites, in an effort to not want to be unclean, would add to the biblical law a fence to be really, really sure that they wouldn't cross any boundaries. And the extra biblical fence that they added was that a Jew should not even go into a Gentile's home. They added that to the law. That's not what the law said. It was an additional fence. Now why, think about this, why would they not want to go into the home of a Gentile? Well, you'd be around the Gentile stuff. You'd be around the Gentile himself. But really at the heart of it seems to be this. You would be offered Gentile food. Because this is a culture of hospitality. This is a culture where people would take care of one another. And if a Jew went into a Gentile's home, it was inevitable they would be offered food. And that food would not meet the dietary code that Israel had been given. So to fence themselves and their supposed cleanness, they added to the law their addition, don't even go into a Gentile's home. Now why am I belaboring all this? Because it really is at the heart of understanding this passage that is so critical to understanding the largeness of the gospel at work. Peter is confronted by the Lord and told to go into the house of a Gentile. His name is Cornelius. This is where you can find him. Go in. And Peter's immediate instinct would be, no, you don't go into the house of a Gentile because you'll be offered something to eat. And the Lord in this passage levels that resistance by removing that dietary code as a requirement that a Jew would have for supposed righteousness. So that's what's going on. Three simple points this morning. The first one is the past. The second is the paradigm shift. And then the third one is the point of the passage. So quickly and hopefully helpfully, the past. Israel was to be distinct. They were to be holy from the nations, even in what they ate. This is phase A of the good news that I announced to you, that our menu has changed. Listen to Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. 
If you've not heard this before, this is going to sound really weird. If you have heard it before, I hope this morning it, it begins to make more sense. But to prove how holy the Lord was, how he was not to be approached simply, he was to be regarded with great caution and reverence and wonder, the Lord gave Israel a diet code. And this is part of it in Leviticus 11. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, Say to the Israelites, Of all the animals that live on land, these are the ones that you may eat. You may eat any animal that has a divided hoof and that chews the cud. There are some that only chew the cud or only have a divided hoof, but you must not eat them. The camel, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is ceremonially unclean for you. The hyrax, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. The rabbit, though it chews the cud, does not have a divided hoof. It is unclean for you. And the pig, though it has a divided hoof, does not chew the cud. It is unclean for you. You must not eat their meat or touch their carcasses. They are unclean for you. Now those of you who love barbecue like me, those of you who have a, a recreational pastime of cooking and exploring, there's a little part of you where your face would fall as you read that, right? Oh man, to be an Israelite means you miss out on so much. Of course, our medical doctors in the room are saying, no, you're not really missing out on too much. So somewhere in there, there truly is good news, trust me, that our menus with what Christ Jesus has done, that it is not attached to our cleanness, is really good news. It's really beautiful news. And it's something that we can enjoy and celebrate together. How things had been for Israel were that they knew that God had revealed His will in His Word, i.e. Leviticus 11. It was for the purpose of understanding Yahweh's holiness in His worship and in His presence. But it was wrongly applied by the people of God. It was perverted into such a way that they saw it as self-righteousness. They added to it their fences and skewed Yahweh's relationship with all the peoples of the earth in what they did. As a matter of fact, if you want evidence of it, it shows up in Acts chapter 11, verses 1 through 2. So the Lord has come to Peter. He's given him this trance, this vision, this revelation of good news. Acts chapter 11, Luke records the believer's response to Peter. That Peter has gone into a Gentile's home. Here's where you see the fence and the hostility it creates between believers. In Acts 11 verses 1 and 2 it says, The apostles, the apostles and the believers throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, you went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. And Luke says they attacked Peter. These were the doctrinal purists who said, Peter, you've blown it. You have blown the holiness code. You have discredited the Lord. You have discredited our message because you foolishly went into the house of a Gentile. Which, remember, is not what Scripture forbade. It's not what Scripture said you couldn't do. That was the fence. That was the addition to it. And so Sinclair Ferguson, in his sermon on this passage, he takes a few minutes to highlight, as I will attempt to do, how sometimes the most hurtful and painful criticism is not from the world towards the church, but it's within the church. It's when God and the gospel are not understood by the good guys. And the good guys turn on the faithful witness and shoot the messenger. Have you known that to be true in your own life? 
or a brother or a sister in the faith started shooting at you or shooting at someone you knew was being faithful and being true? I think Sinclair Ferguson is right. That's, that's the most wounding and hurtful criticism. But we're told from day one it existed. Luke, uh, Acts chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. As soon as Peter had obeyed the Lord, here come the people shooting at him. Then in Acts chapter 11, this whole story is rehearsed again. This is Peter telling them, let me tell you about the trance and the vision I had and how everything has changed. And that everything has changed... That's the paradigm shift, our second point. There is a paradigm shift that happens here. Now, you know what a paradigm shift is. It's when suddenly everything changes from how it's always been. Expectations are redefined. Uh, I know my children have lived through a paradigm shift. The closest thing I can use to explain it is in, in our community where we live, once you finish seventh grade, you leave the elementary school for good. And you now go to the high schooler as an eighth grader. And now suddenly what happens for those of you who've lived through this? It's a paradigm shift. There are new teachers, there are new classes, there are new hallways, there are new rules, there's new expectations. They treat you more like a, a young adult. That's a paradigm shift. Suddenly everything you knew as a rhythm and way of life is, is redefined. A paradigm shift is happening here. Imagine if you have never eaten these things that descend from heaven before Peter in this trance and this vision. And suddenly the Lord says, as he does in verse 13, rise, get up, kill, and eat. That would be pretty hard to do when those foods have never come to your lips. They've been wrong to eat. And that's a paradigm shift. Paradigm shifts can be very hard to live through. I had a professor in seminary in St. Louis who told us that when he was a little boy, he and his friends would sneak into the movie theater. And his parents did not give him permission to go to the movies. His parents thought the movies were bad and he shouldn't go, but he really wanted to go to the movies. And so he would sneak in and watch the movies with his friends and then sneak out. He told us, and he was an elderly man when he said this, he said, men, I can't go into the movie theater today and smell the popcorn without feeling guilty and like I'm doing something I shouldn't be doing, right? So if you're not, you, if, if something's always been wrong and suddenly it's right, it's okay, and it's good, that can be hard to clear that hurdle, right? Absolutely. We talked through this in premarital counseling, by the way. I talked to those who get married, and, and we talk about, look, honeymoon's coming. And if you've fought the good fight and you've tried to be faithful to get to this point, you're going to have a paradigm shift to live through. Because what has been untouchable, undoable, off limits all of your life, suddenly the Lord smiles on it because it's in its proper context. And that can be a paradigm shift for people, right? Some of you have lived through that. And it's a joyous paradigm shift, don't get me wrong, but it's a paradigm shift. It's a hurdle that you cross, and it's like, is this okay? So here's Peter in a trance with a vision. And of all things, the Lord has, it says a sheet. Some translations say a sail. It's trying to capture that image of, of this big piece of fabric. I call it a tablecloth. It sounds like a tablecloth to me. And it descends from heaven from the four corners, and it's filled with all these animals that were understood to be unclean. And the Lord says, Peter, get up, kill and eat. And Peter says, no, 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 not me. Three times the Lord says, Peter, get up, kill and eat. Three times Peter says no to the Lord. So if you're wondering if this is a hard hurdle for Peter to clear, 
It really is. The evidence is there. It, everything about it feels wrong to him. And yet the Lord is saying, no, those boundaries, they're gone. And so that's good news. The Lord dissolves boundaries, and he alone dissolves the boundaries that he gives. We don't have the power to do this. And by the way, there's another sermon to preach on this trance and hearing from the Lord. This is a unique time in redemptive history where the Lord did this. We do not expect Him. We believe that all revelation is given to us now in His Word and in His Son. If you'd like to talk through that, I'd love to talk to you. So please don't take this in a direction it was never intended to go. But this specific message that He has for us to understand, first it's about the change of the diet code. But the real point of the passage... And this is our third point. The real point of the passage is that the dividing wall of difference and of hostility with Gentiles, that Jew-Gentile distinction, has fallen. It is no more. And so the Jew who wrongly had looked down on the Gentiles as unclean, as common to man, as not worthy of going into their home, the Lord says, that's not true. That is changing forevermore. Now all human beings, all people groups are within reach of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That the church, according to scripture, is going to have diversity to it. It's not just going to be people of one nation. Jerusalem is not at the center of it. It is now the four corners of the whole earth. And that's the point and why Luke emphasizes this so much. And it is a hard hurdle for those people to clear. Because everything they've known and they understood was it's all about a Jew and your Jewishness and your own sense of cleanness. And now that is washed away, that is erased. Those dividing walls of ethnicity and culture and race are erased. And I want that to sink in for a moment. In a culture right now, not just in America but worldwide, that is a, that is a boiling point on the subject of race. The church and the church alone has the categories to understand how human beings are to see and regard other human beings. And this is it right here. Listen to what the Apostle Paul, now years later after this, what he would say about this issue. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 16. This is the same issue. Listen to what he says about the dividing wall of hostility. He says, therefore, remember that formerly you who are Gentiles by birth and called uncircumcised by those who call themselves the circumcision, which is done in the body by human hands, remember that at that time you were separate from Christ. You were excluded from citizenship in Israel and foreigners to the covenants of the promise without hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who once were far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made the two groups, Jew and Gentile, one, and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility, by setting aside in his flesh the law with the, its commands and regulations. His purpose was to create in himself one new humanity out of the two, thus making peace, and in one body to reconcile both of them to God through the cross by which he put to death their hostility. That's the Apostle Paul, the religious zealot trained to be a Pharisee, 
hating the church, hating the name of Jesus, persecuting the church. And now he's converted, scales have fallen from his eyes, and he understands there is no distinction between Jew and Gentile. Jesus has made all of humanity one. Everyone is welcome in the house of God, the kingdom of God, when they come through faith in Jesus. That is profound. The world has never heard anything like this. It blew Peter's mind. It blew the apostles' mind. It seemed unbelievable. And so as I finish this morning, what does all this mean for us today? That's a lot of words. That's a lot of content. That's a lot of history. What does it all mean for our lives in Greenwood, South Carolina and beyond? I think it means this. There is no unlovable, there is no unredeemable, there is no unwinnable person to the kingdom of God. There is no one unsavable because they are from the wrong side of town or they're from the other side of the railroad tracks or they're not educated enough or because they don't look or sound or act the right way. They don't live up to our customs, our practices, our traditions, our way of seeing things. There is no human being that is not welcome in the church of our Lord and in the kingdom of our God when they come to Christ with faith and repentance. We must not mistake or misunderstand our, or underestimate the power of the gospel in the lives of people. God has... God can and God will call any person out of any background, out of any sin, out of any point of view, out of any perversion, out of any confusion to bend their knee to the person of Christ. He never leaves us as we were, but says... Such were some of you, but you were washed, you were cleansed, you were sanctified, you were made holy by the blood and power of Jesus. That's the gospel. And that is what it means to be his church. We regard all men and all women, all children of all people groups through a lens of the gospel, the dividing walls of hostility, of one people group thinking they're better than another, those are all abolished, they're erased forever. And so the church sees the whole earth as a garden that belongs to God and a garden that should bear fruit to the glory of God. And in all four corners of this garden, this earth, he is producing fruit. And he calls his church to go forth and conquer by preaching the gospel, by making known what Jesus has done for sinners. And so that's what it is to be the church. That's part of what it is to be the church according to Scripture. We understand that a peacemaker has come, and he reconciles people to God himself, and he reconciles people to people. And the subject matter is always the gospel. It's always the glory of of God. And so I close with this. Have you been converted in this way? Have you seen dividing walls of hostility fall in your own heart and in your own mind? Have you seen your heart change? Have you found that you can love people who aren't like you, who think differently, practice differently, but something about you has been converted? Your heart has been enlarged. It's been changed. Have you been converted in this way? Have you been reconciled to God? Have your dividing walls of supposed superiority, have they fallen? 
The scriptures say that they do. And they've fallen once and for all and forevermore. Let's pray that that would be true of us. Lord, we thank you for the beauty of what we've heard. The paradigm shift that's changed things forever. That now the church is diverse forever. Now the boldness to preach the gospel is unhindered to the four corners of the earth. Lord, would you make us a church that financially supports that bold preaching in the earth and maybe even sends people to do that preaching in all the earth. And for our missionaries who have gone and who are going, would you bless them in their going, even encourage them by this reminder of how the gospel is unhindered in its work in your earth. Lord, encourage us as we see what Jesus has done for us, that not only are our menus enlarged, but our love for people is enlarged. Would you do that? Would you help us to trust him more and more that we might be a faithful church in Christ Jesus? It's in his name we pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus.
May the grace, the mercy, and the peace of God be with you and may it enable you to trust Him more and more as you take the gospel to the four corners of your life. Amen.